uh, we learned all the international experiences that, that people have had, and we focused on the big picture, just not just London, but globally. So, what is the big picture? The big picture is the population growth that the world will be going through throughout all of our lifetimes. And this is going to have major implications on the way that we live and how we live and the things that we use to go about our daily lives. And with more than 2 billion people of growth within the next 40 years, that's unbelievable. So, it, and it's going to be heavily urbanized too. 75% of that population living in urban areas. So what will be some of the global issues that we're going to come face to face with? And we're already starting to. The first one is we're going to allude to is peak oil. Because most of the society we live in today is based off of cheap oil. It was globalized by it over the past 60 years. And we're incredibly reliant on it. Another thing is mobility, which is heavily linked to peak oil. Relating to 1973 and the energy crisis, people weren't driving as much because it caused mobility issues because people couldn't have gas to power a vehicle. And another aspect of it is public health. With the amount of driving and, and inactivity that's going on in our current urban developments, how is it affecting us as a society? whether it's obesity, diabetes, cancer, um, car cardiac arrest, all sorts of different issues. And one of the most forgotten ones in our field is mental health, how the city is impacting people's psychology. And also food scarcity too, because when it gets expensive to ship salads and the types of products and foods that we rely on because of the amount of people that live in such congested areas, how are we going to eat, essentially? Mm -hmm. And one of the most publicized ones is definitely climate change. Because this ties the entire mesh together, essentially. Whether it's droughts, flooding, uh, natural disasters in, in rural and coastal areas. So, this is telling the story of London and how it's grown throughout the past uh, 200 years, and this is coming to the streetcar network that was built on in the late 1800s, and how development occurred, because they didn't have vehicles, but they had an electric streetcar system that people relied on, Then eventually they pulled it out. And then we came to after World War II, and in 1961, cheap oil, boom, collection of subdivisions all over the city. And we've been replicating this for the past <coughs> seven years, and it's just, he kept growing. And you can see as the energy crisis happened, a little bit of development, then comes 1993. This is what we're still trying to fund. This is what we're still trying to build. London is going to be a city in the future that's going to be more localized. It's going to have better opportunities for, for future generations. And so, Citizens of today have the opportunity to live across the city instead of across the country. With all of those principles in mind, we came up with a simple, clear, black and white vision for people. And that is to create something that is connected, not just to the city, not just to the surrounding neighborhoods, but to the region and to the world. And also, we want to make it exciting. We want people to come to this place and feel, wow. We want people to just be attracted to it and not just it being a collection of beautiful aesthetics. So giving them reasons, and also green, realizing the environmental constraints that we're going to be facing as a future society over the next 100 years. So what might the future of London look like based off of SHIFT and the London Plan, which are some of the most innovative things that I've noticed that have been occurring uh, around the city. So orienting it to be rapid transit. And initially, they're, they're still in the concept of going BRT or LRT, but for our master plan, we included one specific one, and we'll give our reasons for that. So transit-oriented development instead of collections of suburbs that you depend on vehicles for the sustainability of one. And this is the future land use plan that, that's in the draft process right now. Um, and you can see along Wellington Road how it's going to be, there we go, how it's going to be uh, 
transit corridor. So they're going to intensify those areas and create neighborhoods instead of just tracks and tracks of housing. So what kind of techniques can be applied to our site? First off, we looked at the seven rules of sustainability. So trying to get that, that interconnected street system back, having the good public transit that we used to have by restoring the streetcar city, and also smarter, greener infrastructure that, that will work in the long run. Another one that we included to it was the theory of walkability that uh, landscape architect and uh, city planner Jeff Speck came up with in his book, Walkable City. I strongly advise everybody to read it. But anyways, he came up with the concept that in order for people to walk and to invite people to walk, the walk has to be useful, it has to be comfortable, it has to be interesting, it has to be safe. That's how you're going to get people to actually go between these buildings and those public spaces, by meeting those parameters. He linked it a lot into the psychology of being a human being, which is interesting. And another one was the charter for new, ur ur new urbanism. And this basically, it goes for more traditional urban forms. And uh, this helps a lot with building with the context of that neighborhood because it is a historical streetcar suburb, essentially, with the hospital and, and whatnot all around it. So it, it would help build within the context instead of just putting new, 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 and nothing fits in. So completing the Monet painting that we've been gift wrapped. All those parameters gave us this. And what this is, it's not a master plan, it's a directional plan. Because we don't want to prescribe something to this community and say, this is the master plan, it's final, this is what it is. But we want to give them a direction, where to head with certain aspects and certain ideas that they could implement, uh, should they choose to do so. So this is essentially looking at the railroad corridor, which in the future that we're projecting is going to be extraordinarily significant because we're essentially investing back into our rail systems instead of ripping the rails up, which is smart in the long run. And uh, to the southernmost point, uh, we have all the major points. Uh, highlighted in the next few slides, but we're trying to connect this to St. Thomas using the rail corridor, and also to the downtown and potentially to the airport. So what we have here is what is a vacant lot right now, which is the, the lot up for sale, and it's prime location to put a new London and Port Stanley Railroad and having that regional connection back in. And this is what's existing, and this is what we have proposed. So tying in the LRTs with that, because historically it was all electrified, but we ripped it out. Now we're kind of bringing a lot of those principles back, uh, so tying into the connection of it. But we're also integrating the pedestrian promenades and the cycling infrastructure with this rail line. So we're not just completely separating humans from this rail line and backlogging everything onto it. We're using it to our advantage to be a multi-use corridor. And it's significant because it's one of the only ones that connects to the region without having to stop the traffic lights. So, which is pretty handy. So as you can see in this render, you can see the pedestrians and the trains in the background floating with the passengers. Um, and this is a section of how we're going to be integrating all of the infrastructure. So starting from the far right side, you can see the pedestrian promenade going to what's going to be our market square. I'll get to that in a moment. And also the cycling, the trains, and even the platform. But on the other side of the station, it acts as a uh, bus rapid transit terminal, so tying into the ship. Because realizing it, Wellington Road, to put it as an LRT, would cost an extraordinary amount of money. So having the rail lines be the LRT, and those streets be the DRT, and having it integrated with this in the heart of the neighborhood, it's halfway between the roundhouse and it's halfway between the Chen's River. So, working for a benefit. Um, this is going to the Soho Marketplace, and that's what's existing, and this is what we have proposed. So this would act during the weekdays as a community center, but then on weekends, Saturdays and Sundays, it turns into almost like a trail den. For those of you not familiar with trail den, it's where local farmers come in and sell their, their produce, their, their food and animals and stuff. It's, it's a fantastic experience. 
and it's got affordable rates too, and it's linking that money back into the local economy. So, okay, uh, so this is looking at one of the prime locations along the riverfront, um, and when we did our site visit, this is what it currently looked like. It was a vacant lot on the earth photos that we used. It showed buildings, but uh, don't be fooled. So this is what's what was there then, and then this is what we're planning to turn into. So a piazza, a, uh, a grand public square, right up against the riverfront, but but out of the floodplain. So it, we don't have to worry about those parameters. And we decided to name it after one of the most famous Londoners, uh, Sir Adam Beck. And those of you that don't know, he is the gentleman that is the reason Toronto developed because he provided the electricity for its development by building the reservoir at uh, Niagara Falls on the dam. Uh, so these are the different elements of mid-rise buildings that will integrate with it, still keeping in context of the neighborhood and not putting high-rise point towers because we looked at infrastructure and how putting a substantial amount of high-rise might o overload it and this is most comfortable for the population. The, this whole vision will tie into the community improvement plan that the city of London will, that has put out. And this is a quote that's helping define our vision. Instead of tearing down all these historical assets and beautiful buildings that we've been blessed to have, we're complementing them with infill that's, that's just dedicated to improving that community and keeping that sense of Soho and tying it into the neighboring downtown, Western Fair District, and also the uh, and also Old South as one of the best neighborhoods in Canada. So those connections and how we're not going for grandiose, we're going for what they can easily implement on those infill properties. So thank you very much.